You are listening to Influencers from the Conference Board. How does an activewear brand become an activist icon, deliberately or despite itself? Can product, purpose, profit, and politics mesh, or do they risk unraveling? And what's the story behind the unconventional Patagonia beer? These questions and more are discussed in this month's Marketing and Communications Center Chat. Marketing Institute leader for the Conference Board, J.P. Kulvine, sat down with Vincent Stanley, Patagonia's Director of Philosophy, who has been involved since the early years and co-authored The Responsible Company with his uncle and brand founder, Ivan Chouinard, to discuss these issues. We present that conversation now. Hi, and uh, thanks for attending. My name's J.P. Kulvine, so you hear it in the original pronunciation just once in this conversation. Um, as uh, Alex said, I've worked in uh, marketing all my adult life, or at least as far as I can remember back uh, across CPG. But most recently, when I worked at Procter & Gamble in corporate strategy, I got particularly interested in brands that are able to elevate themselves among the rest of brands th through, through creating meaning, as I call it uh, uh, in my book, meaning through having a meaningful mission, myth, and creating a truth. Uh, I call them Uber brand, and maybe we'll get to talk about uh, why we call it that and, and how it works. Um, I'm pretty sure about it because one of the brands that keeps popping up uh, when I research, when I write, when I teach with my students, um, and when I work with my clients is Patagonia, uh, which has really been uh, a brand that has pursued a higher purpose uh, in its uh, last 40 plus years. And there is a person uh, beyond the founder, obviously, Yvonne Chouinard, and that person is Vincent Standy, who has been intimately uh, uh, linked to this purpose and this philosophy at Patagonia. In fact, Vincent is the director of philosophy at Patagonia, so I'm uh, very excited uh, that we can have it here for a chat. Hello, Vincent. Uh, thanks Hello, for uh, getting on the show. Hi, JP. Thanks for having me on. Uh, unfortunately, we can't uh, see Vincent, which was the plan. We had a little bit of a technical snafu, but um, it's most important to hear what Vincent has to say. Let me introduce Vincent. Uh, take just a few minutes because I think the background is very important to understand the depth uh, really of uh, the purpose and the meaningfulness of the purpose at Patagonia. Vincent has been with this brand um, for over 40 years, but he started at the tender age of six, as he told me before. He'll tell us that story. He is a storyteller. He is an author. He is a poet. Uh, he is a philosopher, but he's also a business person, and he's lived and practiced at this intersection between business uh, and uh, business ethics and philosophy, and obviously in the context of Patagonia sustainability. So I think highly relevant for our audience. Uh, Vincent has initiated uh, things like the Footprint Chronicles uh, at Patagonia, which traces the social and um, uh, ecological impact of Patagonia's product and action uh, and tries to make it transparent. He is one of the authors behind the famous Don't Buy This Jacket um, um, uh, 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 advertisement uh, of Patagonia that we might talk about. Um, he has uh, uh, started the Common Threads Partnership, uh, which has uh, Patagonia um, uh, work with other partners to help reduce, reuse, repair, recycle its products. You can see um, his impact runs deep. He also teaches philosophy at the company, at Yale and elsewhere. His wife is also uh, an author um, of memoirs, fictions, essays, and she is also involved in Patagonia as an environmental editor for Patagonia Publishing. So you can see it runs deep in the family. And I can tell you, Vincent is also the nephew of the founder, Yvonne Chouinard. Um, so the DNA here is intertwined quite deeply. Together with his wife, just recently, they've started a series on talk of talks around radical transparency and, that ha and how that is needed 
in this time of environmental crisis and us doing business within this environment. So with that background, again, I want to welcome Vincent. Thanks so much for uh, taking some time for us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to join. Vincent, you. let's get started with how you joined the brand. And if you could, because you're such a great storyteller, give us some early signs of what would become this deeper mission and purpose of, of the brand that were palpable that you could see or experience from the beginning? I think, um, well, you know, the one story I tell uh, relates to just when I got started at the company. I have been there off and on, but mostly on uh, for 46 years. I joined in 1973, the year we started in uh, Patagonia. But of course, I had known my uncle all my life and, he, and his little climbing equipment company. And one of the seminal lessons for us took place right before I came to work, in which he discovered that the, his major product innovation, the product that had earned his little company the reputation as making the best climbing equipment in the world, the hard steel piton, had become environmentally destructive. Uh, it was used as uh, the pitons or the spikes that climbers use in uh, cracks connected to rope system to, for protection. And uh, the more, every time one of these spikes was uh, hammered into a crack, it widened the crack slightly. And on these famous routes, they would be used by uh, multiple climbers during a season. And so even when the people working for Chenard all of a sudden came to the realization that the very way we make our living is actually destroying our sport and desecrating the rock. His question then was, is there anything we can do differently? And there was because British climbers used a different system. And, but that was problematic because uh, it was a huge investment to come up with uh, the money for the tools and dyes to develop the system to manufacture what they called nuts. They were little wedge, aluminum wedges that you could twist into a crack without hammering so it wouldn't damage the rock. He went ahead and he made the investment, but the critical thing was to issue a catalog with a 12-page essay that was part manifesto and part user's manual on why climbers should switch from pitons to chalks and then how to use them. So this essay went out to give you an idea of the impact it had. 70% of the business was pitons in June 1972 when the catalog went out. And the day I came to work in March 1973, business was already 70% chalks. So that essay had been discussed at the base of every climb and every climbing magazine and by every climbing club and had transformed climbing in North America. That was a lesson that we didn't make much use of for a very long time, but I think it, it gave us a kind of cultural confidence that was developed, you know, the world of climbers, they were all friends and equals, there maybe three degrees of separation between everybody who worked at Chenard Equipment and every climber on the planet. And I think that, that helped us orient our marketing and our communication to we always treated our customers as friends and equals. And that if we came to be persuaded of something that needed changing, that we could persuade others, that we could bring our customers along with us. And, and that message uh, came to fruit in the late 1980s and early 90s when we started to put environmental messaging in the catalogs. Right, and we see on a slide here the shed actually that is behind the current headquarters at Patagonia, which has become this kind of mythical place almost where Yvonne actually still works and forges. Um, so it's been elevated and it, it, I guess it symbolizes this concern of making products that have the least impact on the environment possible. Um, which is something that continues today, I guess, and has evolved over time. You're no longer making climbing equipment, but I guess it's reflected in your other products? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that 
one of the things that happened to us in the clothing business, we thought the clothing business would be a lot easier than the climbing business. I mean, you're dealing with iron and steel. It's a uh, yeah, heavy, messy business, it's dang- dangerous. We were always worried about, absolutely worried about the quality of our gear, um, that if we failed, that we would hurt people. And clothing, that felt kind of easy to us. But once we got we got into it, um, we were also removed. We weren't making the clothes ourselves. We were designing, we were specking, we were doing the coloring and the marketing, but the clothes were made elsewhere. And when we started to discover quite, we discovered quite by accident, the, the, uh, some of the chemicals used in what we thought of as a natural fiber as cotton. And we, we learned the, these, uh, the more we investigated, the more we learned how harmful these chemicals were to the soil and, and to the air. And so we began to look into our supply chain much more closely, I think, than uh, other companies did at the time or that we had done in the past. Um, and began to accept responsibility, I think, not just for the actions that we undertook, but everything done in our name. The, what was the quality of the wastewater released in the dye houses? What was, what were the conditions? What was the temperature on the factory floor in which human beings were working? All of those things we began to see that they went into the creation of a jacket that had a Patagonia label and we were responsible for it. And I'm fast forwarding to today and I'm showing a picture of Patagonia, probably employees, since you give them time off for this, um, protesting, demonstrating in Washington, and it says, we resist, we build, we rise. Everyone is uh, imminently aware, or many of the marketers at least, will be imminently aware of this Patagonia outspoken uh, uh, activist action. Um, Question to you, I mean, it comes from such a deep and long history. It didn't it, it, it didn't come about overnight. However, nowadays it feels like every brand wants to get in on purpose. Do you think, through your experience, that a brand um, that has purpose and the meaningful purpose as a company needs to be born that way? Or can you become later, uh, in your later history as a brand, as a company, a valid and meaningful purpose-led business? Oh, yes, I think you can. I I mean, in some ways, we are the company we started. Um, There was always this love of wild places and a love of nature and a desire to protect it. But all of the work that we began to do in the supply chain, none of that was stuff that we did at the start. I do think the difference is, I I, I think every company you and I have talked about this. Every company, I think, has its own DNA. It's like a snowflake or a human being. Every business has its own culture that makes it makes it its unique self. And I and I think that when when companies choose to take public stands, that it should be related to that culture and also related to the purpose if it's a product or a service, and that that voice should be consistent over time. You know, when Gillette came out with the the ad about toxic masculinity, people were asking me, well, what what do you think of that? And and my response was, well, let's see what Gillette is advertising two years from now. You know, if this is, if, if, if a company takes a longstanding position, it earns the trust, even when people disagree with you, they understand that that's what you're about. The Patagonia has been talking about public land protection since 1975. Right. Right. Yeah, that's an important point. I I talked to Dave Rappaport at Ben & Jerry's the other day on my podcast, and he said, on Gillette, let's see what they do, because it's the doing that's important versus the saying. Uh, I guess you're agreeing with that? Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and from, from several points of view, one from an ethical point of view, but also from a marketing point of view, you don't want to change your story every six months because we're, we're no longer in a time where people believe that. Uh, right. That, right. That's transparent that you're making, that you're making up a good story to be heard. But if it doesn't resonate 
and people have very sensitive filters these days, uh, you're, you're not going to be trusted for that. You're going to be right. distrusted for it. Right. I'm showing our uh, listeners the um, mission statements of Patagonia I, in plural because uh, it has just changed early this year. Um, the old one read, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Um, you were involved in that mission statement. You were involved in the change to the much shorter new one, which reads, we're in business to save our home planet. Um, I know you were hesitant the first time around. Uh, you got to like the old mission statement, kind of complex, but covering product, why you're in business, uh, what's your higher purpose. How do you feel about the new one? Where are the differences? Why this change? Yeah. Well, you know, this, uh, uh, the, the original mission statement was when we adopted it, I, I was uh, rather nervous about it. We had, we had been a company for years without a mission statement. I was suspicious of them. And I didn't think it was entirely true. Uh, I thought we did build the best product and I, I thought we made efforts to reduce our harm, but we really didn't do much then to uh, inspire others to make changes. And we didn't know very much yet about the inner workings of our supply chain. But over time, I think it, it really became a kind of mantra in the company, not that everybody went around saying it, but everybody understood those three clauses and everybody understood that as a part of the job to the point where I think we really came to embody that statement. Now, the second, the new mission statement is something actually that I, I wasn't involved in. It was really uh, came from evil. And he was started talking for, he was for about a year. He said, we got to change the mission statement. And part of his impulse, I think, is that we've gotten involved in the food business and we've gotten involved with certain practices in agriculture that actually restore soil to health. Now, if this sounds a little bit of a stretch, let me go back and say that that second clause, cause no, and the old mission statement, cause no unnecessary harm, has been deeply rooted in the business, but every step that we take to reduce environmental harm we understand that in manufacturing clothes, we're still taking back, we're extracting more from the planet than we know how to repay. We're only reducing the harm we do. But when we start to deal with regenerative agriculture of actually bringing soil back to health, either by better grazing practices or uh, better cultivation practices, you're not just doing less harm, you're actually doing positive good. I think Evon wanted to make some room for that. I think also the phrase environmental crisis has now become a little strange because uh, the more the environmental crisis actually comes home to us, it came home very directly to Patagonia about a year and a half ago when we had a series of fires in Southern California that displaced over a two week period, 75% of our employees from their homes. <laughs> and then three weeks later with the landslide in Montecito cut off 80 employees from work because the freeway was closed while they dynamited the boulders that had come down from the tops of the mountains. So the, the, the effects of volatile climate have become more tangible. The environmental crisis now seems so joined at the hip with the social crisis of inequality because we've had so much advance We've got, we've de generated so much wealth. We've generated so much, so many technological advances in the last 20 years and not brought in all of the people in with us. So that phrase is a little odd. So the idea, we're in business to save our home planet, is to have this tangible idea of, of the, uh, the tangible home rather than talk about an abstraction like right. the environment. This is right. not something apart from us. This is something... That is a, that we are a part of, right? And I, and I read that Yvonne felt that there needs to be much more of a sense of urgency. That he felt that we should no longer talk, talk about the symptoms, saving. I think he literally says, you know, let's not, you know, rally around saving the ice uh, uh, ice bear. They are already the polar bear. They are already dead. Let's try quickly to work on what causes 
this catastrophe, uh, hence this this emphasis. Yeah. I I have a question though, and I'm showing our listeners your famous "Don't buy this jacket" ad, and I will show the detail below, which were all about the Common Threads initiative of reducing, repairing, use, and recycle. Um, the manufacturers um, among our members, and there are many of them, will say, aren't you going too far in going away from your product, or even if you were a service industry, from your service, and becoming purely a activist hub, you even have an environmental activist hub that is so called, mm -hmm. and, and, and won't the the product and the business part suffer. Shouldn't, shouldn't businesses be around to create good products, period? Yeah, I think that that was part of my reservation with uh, adopting the new mission statement. But I think that once we, once we did adopt it, what happened for us internally, I think, is that the mission, even though it was deeply embedded before, became a little clearer. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a North Star, and it, it's also aspirational. It's not really true of the company that we're in business to save our home planet. But I think that increasingly, knowing the culture as I do, I think increasingly that will be the case. Within that, you know, there are clauses there in our, in our charter, in our business charter, we have adopted, because uh, we are a B Corp, so in, in legally, in our legal definition in California, we've adopted several purposes, and one of them remains build the best product. The other is to reduce harm continuously. So all of the old elements of the of the mission statement are still very much with us, but this new statement is the aspirational statement for the next couple of decades. Um, I'm I'm showing a little bit of your. Um, by now, I think very prominent activist uh, expressions. Uh, the president stole your land, um, but also on a very local level from Chicago, shut down the pipeline through one of the Great Lakes. Um, you're, you're, you're not subtle about recommending um, A, to go to vote, but also who to vote for, particularly in local elections. Actually, you're very much involved in grassroots politics Two questions, but in this order. One is a question I already got from our members is, do most people who wear Patagonia actually know, don't they buy it because others buy it because of the nice colors, because it keeps you warm? Uh, some of them are called the Patagucci. They buy it because you know they wanna hang out at South by Southwest. Uh, maybe not for the reasons you would want them to. Um, how do you think about that? Is that a good thing? Do you want to be a missionary and convert them all? Is it actually a distraction? Could you do more business if you weren't doing all these uh, activist activities? Well, actually, uh, there are several questions in there. I, I would I would think that probably ten years ago that maybe I don't I don't have. Uh, hard research for it, but I would anecdotally, I would say that 90% of the customers were buying Patagonia goods on the basis of uh, its quality. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think there's more of a, it's, it's in, it's in uh, fashion in certain ways, in certain circles. And I've seen that happen four or five times in my career at Patagonia, that, that will pass, but we'll continue to have Loyal company, uh, loyal customers, who come to us on the basis of quality, but increasingly, I think, also on the basis of values. There was, um, I think, that a lot of customers who who may not share our politics respect the company for its stands. Especially, we do try to. Stick to our knitting. We try to stick to the issues that we know about pretty deeply, which include public lands and conservation. The only two candidates we endorsed were, were two senatorial candidates in Western states, uh, uh, Senator Tester and Jackie Rosen in Nevada. And we endorsed them be because of their uh, uh, support for public lands legislation. So, um, 
I think I think a number of customers probably forgive us uh, for some of the stands we take, but I think we've also attracted a number of customers on the basis that we do have, even if they don't share all of our values, that we have them in the first place. Um, you know, when Danone uh, established its North American subsidiary as a B Corp, which is by far, by six times, uh, I think six times larger than the next largest B Corp, Emmanuel Fabe said he wanted to take the whole company B, and he said that he was originally inspired by the Don't Buy This Jacket ad that because it taught him that you could uh, you could attract customers on the basis of values as well as on the basis of instincts. And this is, I think this is part of the purpose movement and all that, but I think this is also until recently uncharted, uncharted territory for companies because the marketing arts were so tied to uh, manipulation and, and myth without much sense of authenticity behind it, that people are very much drawn to a story that's consistent, that's real, and that also reflects human values that are that include a great commercial product, but are larger than that, because the questions right. of life are larger than the products we make. Yeah. And that is Danone, the uh, dairy company. I just wanted to clarify that. So in a way there, your mission has not only inspired your employees and your customers, but even fellow business people. And I think there's quite a few stories around that. And you even now actively uh, help that, if you like, with a sort of incubator around food, for example. I want, I want to get back to food in a second as uh, kind of your product now being guided by your mission. But you just said something that ties so nicely to you also being a lecturer on philosophy. Uh, and uh, a subject we joked about a little bit, um, uh, me being German and, and us two knowing Adorno a bit, uh, which is um, critical theory, uh, the Frankfurt School would, would maybe say to Patagonia, if Adorno was around today, that what you're doing is you're objectifying uh, kind of needs that uh, uh, people have, and as a good capitalist, you wrap them into sellable items, i.e. the need for preservation, the need for climate change, maybe uh, the aversion against a certain uh, political direction, and you're making money out of that. So congratulations, you're being an even more sophisticated capitalist. Um, and I'm exaggerating to provoke as they would do. How do you think and feel, or how would you respond to Theodore? Well, I, 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 I hate to go back to that ad for the third time. We only ran, ran that ad once, by the way, but the the emphasis of the ad, the, the headline was a, to get your attention, don't buy this jacket, but the actual message was, we don't know how to make a jacket that takes, it gives back to the planet more than it takes. So we as a manufacturer should engage in responsible practices and you as a consumer should question everything that you buy and you do, you should be mindful and you should be thoughtful about it. And so we present that message at the same time. We do make beautiful clothes. I think that, um, you know, one, illust one illustration, by the way, of the values is that after in 2016 for Thanksgiving, we were going to uh, shut down our, this was right after the Trump election, we were going to okay shut down our stores on Black Friday and, and uh, paint the windows black and ask customers to go volunteer for an environmental organization. And a very low-level new employee in, in Ecom came in on Monday morning before Black Friday and said, you know, we're doing the wrong thing. And instead of giving 1% of sales to environmental organizations, which we always do, we should give on that day 100% of sales to environmental organizations. So now on that, so that's what we did. We, it was 100% for the planet on that Black Friday. And we anticipated a, a bump in business and we thought we'd do two and a half million worldwide. And we did 10 million. And half yep. of our customers were new. Half of our customers were people who had never bought Patagonia before. So in a sense, that proves out, you know, that, that, that puts you in the Adorno territory 
But on the other hand, I think it also just speaks to um, <laughs> the human impulse at this point in, in, to, to vote with your dollars um, to, um, uh, to support any activity that represents your values. And you almost enter, I guess, the realm of, of maybe art here and philosophy that he says might be one of the territories shielded a bit from capitalism. But let's not dive further into that. We'll all go uh, to uh, a special lecture on philosophy and business. It yeah. will be exciting. I want to talk about um, Patagonia provisions, and I'm showing a slide about the salmon. And uh, unfortunately, we don't show the beer, which is always a fun story to tell. Um, and I, I guess it's interesting because one, to me, it shows that by now the mission has actually taken over in guiding even your product expansion and where you go. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the significance here that because it goes beyond having food for climbers, right? It goes um, mm -hmm. to actually making it in a way that has a positive impact beyond the food itself. Yeah. You know, I, I think we've been very good at, at accidental discoveries and kind of stumbling into virtue. And we got into the food business not for um, uh, huge moral reasons, but mostly because Evans wanted to have a food company for a long time. He loves to cook and he loves to eat. And uh, but when we got into the food business, we discovered, oh my gosh, there's so many things you can do here um, to make real positive changes and. One of the first discoveries was when we we wanted to carry salmon in retort packages, and um, and the research we did showed that it, you can only really tell that a salmon stock is going to be vital if you catch it after it returns to its native waters. Because if you catch even using uh, uh, the best techniques to catch the salmon on open water, you don't know if it's from a stock that's endangered or not. Um, so that was that was that was a, one of the initial things we found. The the um, we identified we started to look at grains. We were working with a fellow a genius named Steve Jones at uh, Western Washington University Bread Lab, who's identified 41,000 different types of grains that can be uh, planted where they're perfectly adapted to soil and climate, whereas our agricultural system is based on a monoculture of soy, corn, and wheat. So what we see are all these possi extraordinary possibilities for the future. The beer story is a wonderful man named Wes Jackson, an agronomist whose mission has been to restore the Great Plains to health. He's based in Salina, Kansas, invented 20 years ago a perennial wheatgrass has roots that go 17 feet deep into the ground creates the perfect environment for soil creation among the fungi and the microbacteria. Um, patented it, gave it a name, Kernza. Couldn't get anyone to grow it. And uh, because the farmers would say, I can't, why, I, you want me to plant this? It's great, it's good for the soil, but I can't sell it. So what we did is we made it, we partnered with a brewery in Portland, Oregon, and we persuaded Whole Foods to put it in 108 of its West Coast stores. We made a beer out of it. And we got the first 200 acres planted. And now we have interest from a major cereal company to use it as, a, as an ingredient, even if just a 3% um, of their production would result in many tens of thousands, thousands of acres being planted. And the cereal company is interested because of the potential to sequester carbon when you bring soil back to health is tremendous. So right. what we see here is a, an absolute convergence of our environmental goals and our business goals, where we see the possibilities that business can actually create not only Bring the soil back to health, but create products people can use. This is this is kind of our north star, I think, for the next 20 or 25 years. That as we uh, develop new products and new lines of business, that we follow this line of thinking. Right, and 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 one common story that uh, I hear through long conversations with you over the past years is, it, it, you never stop uh, in in 
digging um, back in the supply chain or going forward as far as the impact goes. And sometimes you stumble over yourself. Uh, I'm just showing the footprint chronicles here on the slide that mm -hmm. you are heavily involved in. And you have many stories of people scratching their head, either external to the company or internally and saying, what consequence has the use of these down feathers? What consequence has the use of synthetic microfiber when it comes to now realizing that there are these synthetical microscopic materials that get into the water mm -hmm. stream, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to resolve that. But also organizationally, how do we integrate finances and uh, protecting the environment better? Um, does it sometimes get too much? Does it, uh, how do you deal with, you know, there's never an end. There's never a perfect solution. Um, uh, do you just decide uh, to stop at one point or is it a continuous journey? You know, I think it's a continuous journey. I, I think um, economists describe an, an economy in equilibrium, but I think anybody who's ever been in business knows that there's no such thing in business. Um, business is always evolutionary. It's always um, being disrupted by something. Um, and what we have learned how to do, I think, and I don't think we knew how to do this 20 years ago, but I think as an organization, we've learned how to actually use the constraints that we impose on ourselves, and they're both environmental and social, um, to drive innovation. That when we stop to think about what we're doing and explore alternatives, rather than making our processes, some process. I mean, obviously, some processes we make more efficient every year, but we're not really concentrating on that. We're really concentrating on how do we do things better. And um, that has resulted in um, that's where our growth has come from in the, in the products we've developed out of that mindset. Excellent. And I last question before we open it up, since you mentioned it as an important subject that all are interested in. It's growth, of course, the engine growth. Do you believe it is the right engine? Where do you see Patagonia go and be 10, 15, 20 years from now when your generation between Yvonne and yourself um, is no longer involved in the business? Um, w w what would be your vision? You know, I, I'm, I, I think that... It, it, I'm kind of stumped on this issue, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, so we're now in the process, we wanna become carbon neutral by 2025. And in order to do that meaningfully, we have to find an alternative to fossil fuels for about half the products we make, which are polyester and nylon. And the, in order to develop an alternative, we need to make investments and that invest those investments require growth. I would like to see a, a point where, and I think the company does think, we do think about what would it be like if we shrank by the millions of dollars rather than grew. Can we still stay healthy? Are we, the question is whether you're using growth as a kind of, uh, uh, cover, uh, or is it, is it uh, whether you're developing growth for growth's sake, which, you know, we've always tried to do. We never advertised on the backs of buses. We never pushed our products in, a, um, uh, in order to prime the pump, although we've, we've certainly had a lot of growth in the past few years. So I, I'm, I, I don't know quite how to answer your question. I, I think Patagonia will continue to grow. I think we do not want to, um, you know, try to grow the clothing company to the point where we have to put ads on the backs of buses. Um, and I think that we want to grow the parts of the business that can sustain organic or natural growth. But overall, you know, the, 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 the planetary question here is that you've got a planet with limited resources and you've got an economy that grows at several percent a year, even at two or three percent a year, the difference over decades, until we really know how to give the planet back more than we're taking, 
we're on a on a very difficult path right now. Right. A difficult balance. And with that, I want to open it up to our members who uh, I'm sure have a ton of questions by now. So let's take a look at um, the Q&As. Um, Alex, have you noted one down while I'm reading through this here that stands out for you? Uh, sure. Why don't, why don't you start with, um, with the question about uh, measuring um, measuring any any losses versus any uh, gains as a result of uh, of Patagonia's philosophy. So so Tim Powell asks. It, it it seems likely that Patagonia both gains and loses uh, business because of its value statement. Do you have any ways uh, or research to measure both the gains and the losses, and can you describe them? No, I don't think we do have that. I mean, we all all we know is that we we've. we've uh, The growth rates that we've had the past few years, um, we know that for many of the controversial stands we've taken, say, for instance, our we sued the administration over uh, their re recension of 90% of, of, of the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, when we take controversial stands, we we usually have no adverse overall effect on sales so i'm sure we do so no i don't think i, I think it'd be difficult to conduct that kind of research and I, we don't have it all right there's also a question around how do you handle purpose organizationally is there a, a core group team um uh and it seems like you are the director of philosophy that that uh that is free to think about that and then there are the others or is it fully ingrained and everyone kind of naturally works and how does it work organizationally do you need to recruit do you have a hard time finding people who think like you and would act like you want to um there's a couple of questions there i i think that we um that it's a self that when it's, something is deeply ingrained and in, values are deeply ingrained in the culture, um, they're self-organizing. So, and we have a lot of literature. You know, I wrote a book with Yvonne called The Responsible Company. He wrote, "But My People Go Surfing." Um, we talk, we talk a lot about the actions that we we've we've undertaken. We have a, a detailed website. So there's a lot of there's a lot of literature that our employees can consult rather than having to go to an arbiter. Um, we don't have trouble attracting employees. We have huge numbers of applicants for each position that we, um, that we post. 25 years ago, we had a problem. I remember I hired the first sustainability head at Patagonia, and I had to hire someone from city government, the city of Irvine. The only people I could get from business would have been in 1992 would have been from uh, oil or chemical companies who might not have been interested in working for us. Um, but increasingly, um, and until 2002 or 2003, there were no sustainability programs in business schools, and now every business school of note has one. So increasingly, we get people who are drawn to Patagonia because they they have they're really good at what they do, uh, whether in finance, ops, or marketing, um, and they really want to work for a company whose values align with the values they're teaching their kids at the dinner table. All right. Exactly. We, we've got lots of questions. So I want to do a little fast um, kind of sure. question and answer here. One was, what other Fortune 500 companies do you think are doing a good job um, in communicating their environmentally responsible message, and I want to add personally, and acting on it. Uh, do you have some favorites among the larger companies? Well, among publicly traded companies, um, you know, I, I really like what Unilever has been doing and what Denon has been doing. Um, and Unilever has identified, I think, 40 out of their several hundred brands, 40 as sustainable, and they say that they're getting half their growth and half their profits from those brands. So even though Paul Pullman has left the company, I think they're likely to continue on that path. 
Gotcha. Um, there's a question by Dave who says the footprint uh, chronicles are great for transparency. Uh, he very specifically asked, is Patagonia planning to issue an annual sustainability report disclosing its complete GHG emissions and other ESG factors? Mm, you know, I, I tried to, I wrote one in 2003 and we ended up, we didn't have enough information then. And also the report was was so such a dull reading um, that we thought, you know, we we don't have investors. We're we're owned by the family. So what this report is for customers and it's for NGOs. So that's when they created Footprint Chronicles. Um, I I don't know that. Uh, I think eventually we could produce. We're in a much better position to produce that report because Sustainable Apparel Coalition, through its Hague Index, is taking those measurements in the factories that produce our goods. That's where our impact. Something like 90% of our environmental impact is in the materials we use. Right. Um, we have a question here around the, the, the resource and climate issue being global. Um, in order to solve it, it seems like you need to work with international partners. What, what do you do to mobilize internationally, or are you focused on uh, the U.S. or the markets you're in locally only? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Is it the question in terms of the supply chain or in terms of our activism on local issues? I, I, I guess it could be on both sides. Basically, the question is, you know, climate change is a global issue. Are you acting globally to to help approach this? Yes, we are. Um, but it um, yes and no. We 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 are active wherever we sell, wherever we have a presence. But we aren't where we don't because we don't feel that we know the local conditions or have partners on the ground. So Australia, Korea, uh, Japan, uh, the EU, uh, South America. We we uh, we are environmentally active in all of those markets. All right, and Tim has a question here saying, you know, it's great practices. It probably adds to the cost of manufacturing, which we know it does. How do you compete as a brand then uh, versus others who sell cheaper? And does it not risk um, P Patagonia becoming kind of a niche one percenter kind of boutique brand? Um, now, interestingly, I want to I want to tell a story from the research I did on Patagonia for our book, where uh, in the first crisis in the in the 90s, where the fashion in, and, and garment industry was in a big crisis, a lot of people said, "Oh, finally, Patagonia is going to see that its practices lead you nowhere. They'll be the first to disappear." And I don't want to name names, but a CEO of one big uh, uh, apparel company said, you know, they're going to finally see that it's really good business that wins and not this weird purpose stuff. And that company is now defunct. So it was just an interesting uh, uh, anecdote. But uh, what do you say? Uh, do you risk to play yourself into a corner and remain a small, um, uh, one uh, low percentage brand? And how do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I, I think partly because we came out of climbing gear that we really we really have been very intent on making high quality goods all along. And we've never developed a culture that can really make uh, uh, low quality goods or low cost goods. I was talking to someone uh, at Yale here who was an intern for a fashion company I won't name and said that their practice is to go to their suppliers every six months and ask them to reduce their costs by 3%. So, you know, clothing now is considerably cheaper than it was in the 1970s. But a lot of that has come on the backs of the workers and certainly on the back of the of the planet. And um, I don't think we're a niche brand. I think we're a high quality brand if you look at our sales in comparison to um, some competitors who don't do some of the practices we do i think you'll find patagonia located right up there and again i think it's because of the couple of things the high quality the reputation the trust the level of innovation we have because of our self-imposed restraints 
So, you know, cost cutting or making the cheapest product is, I think, a rather um, kind of an outmoded way of, of thinking now when the, in, when the, because what you're doing is you're privatizing profits and you're socializing costs. Those two yeah. products are, are, are coming at a huge, huge price. Yeah, and I, I can tell from the CPG industry that um, cutting costs uh, and driving profitability that way, uh, driving prices down to drive volume that way, a lot of industries, a lot of categories have been upset um, by seeing premium price competitors coming in and actually stealing the show, literally, in both um, uh, uh, consumer loyalty as well as the overall volume. So it's not necessarily the one way. Um, of course, we have some questions triggered or inspired by Vestgate, I think you call it, um, which is the story that appeared in one of, uh, 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 or now across newspapers, that Patagonia doesn't sell its corporate branded vests to some people anymore. And the question here was, well, aren't you forcing these people to go to competition that is producing less sustainable uh, garments? So aren't you hurting your own mission here? Well, there, there, there's a little bit of misinformation going out there. And, um, this is a co-branded program, uh, corporate sales. It's a fairly small part of our business. And uh, what we decided to do a while back is that the, the program it keeps growing, and we want to. Um, we do want to keep it fairly limited. And we said, you know, when we take on new clients. These new clients should uh, be businesses that, and institutions that are in alignment with our values and our practices. And um, that was reported that we were refusing to sell to people we'd been selling to for a long time. And, and that kind of hurt because um, I don't want people to suddenly feel badly about their co-branded Patagonia vest with the with the name of the bank or uh, any other business that's that's also on there. But uh, at the same time, I think it's quite reasonable for us to, as we do uh, go into that business in the future, that we uh, take on the, that the new people are in, in alignment with our values. Um, a very good question here by Fiona that gets a lot of likes, which is, um, what in your philosophy uh, in communicating with people that are skeptical that your environmental advocacy is simply a marketing strategy? I mean, how, how do you defend against this being greenwashing? How do you differentiate greenwashing and acting honestly, particularly in a current business environment where it seems like everyone is out there to save the earth? sometimes save humanity? I, I think there is consistency and, and trust. Um, and also a real action. So we, now we're, we've been involved, we helped create the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. And all everyone's a member of this. I mean, all the big organizations. Uh, it represents half of the clothing and footwear sold on the planet. And one of the things this organization, since its inception about nine years ago, has ultimately wanted to produce a consumer-facing index, which I think is going to be released. The plan is to release it next year, 2020. So a customer can take a cell phone and hold it up against a hang tag on a pair of jeans, get a QR code, and get an, a social and an environmental rating for that product. That's going to be industry-wide. So in that sense, this is another way to act to prevent to, to make it more difficult to greenwash. In other words, this is the industry getting together and saying, no, we're not going to compete on this stuff. We're going to agree on, on a numerical vetting system and we're all going to subscribe to it. Excellent. Um, maybe one uh, add-on question to that, which is to which extent do you believe in industry and companies being able to self-regulate, self-develop, 
um, get us towards this goal, particularly in light, for example, of a lot of countries or, or, or some countries and governments not signing up to Paris agreements or others versus elected officials um, or institutions like governments, charities, churches, et cetera? And how far do you believe in um, capitalist corporations to be able to, to handle and address this uh, environmental crisis, as you say, efficiently? Um, you know, I, I, I'm of two minds on that. First, I think the genius of capitalism is its self-organization, its capacity for self-organization. And if the if the climate is right, if the customers are demanding something and the people in the industry determine that they want to do something, I think it will happen. Um, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of players out there and there is a lot of, uh, who are who are not particularly ethical. There's a, there are a lot of customers who don't care. There is a role, I think, for regulation, particularly when you're talking about the chemicals that go into into clothing. I don't think you're going to have any. The United States imports 97% of its clothing. You're not going to have any pressure to create those uh, to create regulatory environmental standards here. You you might in Europe. Um, and my hope would be that uh, if there is regulation that they would use the work that the Sustainable Apparel Coalition has done, that the industry has already done to self-regulate itself as a guide. There's the problem with regulation, there's, they're twofold. One is when the regulations are imposed by people who don't really understand the business, and two, when the regulations don't change quickly enough and when they don't adapt to changing conditions. Um, that's uh, uh, that's a real, um, it's very hard on businesses and not very good for, not good for customers either. JP and Vincent, this is Alex. Uh, sorry to interject. I, I'm afraid we've already gone past our hour. Uh, it goes by so quickly when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> So thank you. I just want to wind up here and thank you very much, Vincent, for joining us. Uh, and thank, thank you, you, JP, for leading us through the discussion. Uh, it was wonderful. I hope we got to all of your questions. If we didn't, uh, I apologize. And, and please feel free to follow up with us and, and we can uh, try to get an answer to you. Uh, otherwise, I want to point out our next Centre Chat will be on May 23rd, uh, again at 11 a.m. Eastern. Please note that uh, that's a slight break in convention. We're normally on the last Thursday of the month, but uh, due to the Memorial Day holiday break, uh, we're going to bring that a week forward next month. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you for your, uh, your questions and engagement. And again, thank you, JP, and of course, Vincent. Uh, we hope to see you again at another Centre Chat sh soon. Thanks very much. Was a pleasure. Okay. This has been Influencers from the Conference Board.